Hi, everybody. We're going to be talking about Japanese imperialistic pursuits and focusing on a lot of the war crimes they committed between 1931 and 1945. I want to start by giving a background. So Japan was an isolated nation for hundreds of years. They were forcibly opened up by the United States in 1854. And it was at that time that Japan really realized its backwardness as a nation. So they began to adopt Western principles of science and technology. And there was a rapid transformation of society and especially the military of Japan. So this led to many great military successes. They would defeat China, they would defeat Russia, uh, they would be victors in World War I. So, you know, there was a real change uh, that led Japan to really see itself as a power because of this rapid transformation of their military and their society. And because of this, there was a real ideological transformation. Uh, so these cultural principles that Japan had had for a long time, like Bushido, Yatgai, Kosai, Shintoism, they were reimagined to become more authoritarian and more militaristic, right? So uh, people began to see their own value in proximity to the emperor. So those that were close to the emperor were seen as having high value, and those that were further away from the emperor were seen as having little or no value. So you could see how this would be possible, uh, this would make possible some of the war crimes that would happen in the colonized territory later on. So Japan began to see themselves as a power, but as a small island nation, they realized the only way they could achieve that potential was to expand. So one of the first major expansions was the invasion of Manchuria, which uh, you know was created uh, by the Mukden incident, where uh, they was going to a fake attack that Japan committed on themselves, but it gave them the reason to go in, and they established their own puppet state, Manchukuo, and uh, there were several also around the same time uh, coup attempts uh, in China, the, in Japan, the May 15th incident, the February 26th incident, all of these things kind of further continued that trend toward militarism and authoritarianism. And then we would see a little bit later in 1937, the second Sino-Japanese War, uh, which was uh, began with the Marco Polo Bridge incident. And it was here that really some of those war crimes it, it became much greater, like the rape of Nanjing, one of the worst war crimes in history. So Japan, uh, Japan, even though they initially had some quick success, it would eventually become a quagmire because of China was continued to receive support from the Western allies. And uh, this led to Japan eventually deciding they had to expand the war. Japan was looking for a way to finish the war in China, but needed the critical resources to continue to wage war. There were a few important factors that aided in the decision to launch a surprise attack on the United States. The first was the 1938 embargo on arms sales to Japan by the United States. The second was the 1940 embargo the United States put on scrap iron, which is critical to build weapons and ships. Third was in 1941 when the United States put an embargo of oil on Japan, and shortly after that, the United States froze all Japanese assets. These were the events that led up to the attack of the United States by the Japanese on December 7, 1941. The United States Pacific Fleet lost 19 warships and 300 aircraft in the attack, while 2,390 servicemen and civilians died. Japan had hoped to do a crippling blow to the United States Pacific Fleet with the intentions of using the time the United States sideline to conquer more territories in the Pacific. Unfortunately for the Japanese, the aircraft carriers were not important. The Philippines was one of the first U.S. possessions to fall to the Japanese. Here, the Americans surrendered in high quantities, which included 75,000 of Douglas MacArthur's men. This was known to be the United States' worst defeat. In the Philippines, what was to be known as the Bataan Death March occurred in April 1942. The Japanese made POWs walk 65 miles to concentration camps that were set up in the Philippines. This was a prelude of what was to come by the Japanese and how they treated the POWs. The Battle of Midway is said to be the point in which the war shifted. Up until Midway, the United States was being dealt loss after loss to the Japanese. The important part to remember of the Battle of Midway is that Japan took heavy casualties of ships and experienced pilots. Japan lost four aircraft carriers and hundreds of pilots that were important should Japan want to continue to push the European powers and the Americans out of the Pacific. Japan felt they were the superior race in the Pacific and wanted to expand their influence. They did so by taking countries such as Korea, Manchuria, Guam, Wigalan, Malaya, Singapore, Burma, and New Guinea. With the quick expansion, Japan became overextended and had to protect a large amount of area. During the expansion, Japan was very hostile to those that they conquered, and it was also seen that Japan was very cruel to the POWs they captured. It is said that 27% of POWs died under the Japanese, which was higher than the 4% that was seen by the Germans in the European theater. 
We've touched on them already, but these themes really ramp up from here on. Honor and service to the emperor is not new. These have been exemplified in systems like Bushido and Shintoism long before this time, but they've been largely reinvented to fit the needs of an expanding regime. This Asia for Asians concept has also been growing over time, and now it's being carried out by the Japanese in the form of imperial expansion. This reinvented Bushido takes the form of bonsai charges and kamikaze attacks. The original duty of high-ranking officials is now being pushed onto the average foot soldier, win or die. In this modified Shintoism, the emperor has every right to ask the ultimate price of all of his people, and it's only right that they pay it. Thus, we see these suicide attacks. This show disregard in both life of the self and in others. Perceived superiority comes from folk legends and the idea of a Yamato race being descended from Jimu, the first emperor pictured here. We also see Confucian teachings to a degree with the family hierarchy. Japan, or more specifically, the emperor, is the father to all of his subjects, and they are expected to be happy and subordinate to him, thus we see images like this. And of course, who's to blame for Asia being subjugated already, if not for the Western powers, often depicted as devils or demons. Now we look at Guadalcanal. Henderson Field wasn't a particularly hard thing to capture, keeping it was. Marines were left with insufficient provisions, living on what Japanese rations they could take, being all but abandoned by the Navy. We see bonsai charges here, Japanese soldiers just sending walls of themselves directly into fire from hopeless positions because surrender was not an option at all. All said, Henderson Field stayed under American control. Iwo Jima sees the beginnings of kamikazes, claiming 318 American lives. We also see the use of flamethrowers by Americans to flush out tunnels and bunkers designed by the Japanese as a clever and layered defense. The air bases the Americans would later use to get closer to the Japanese mainland were successfully taken, as were some trophy flags as pictured. Kamikazes were gearing up in Iwo Jima to take as much as possible in Okinawa, damaging 164 ships, sinking 26, and taking the lives of about 5,000 US soldiers. Okinawa was a well-populated island and the Japanese took advantage of this by making Okinawan children work frontline duty. Kamikazes were not indicative of war crimes and neither are bonsai charges, but using child soldiers certainly is. Wrapping up, you'll find all the war crimes listed here are class B and C, meaning charge to average soldiers. This includes, but is not limited to, mass murder of civilians, sexual violence, including rape and forced prostitution in the form of comfort women across Asia, uh, as mentioned before, use of children in battle, various mistreatments of POWs, uh, for example, executions in general, and more specifically, the Bataan Death March. Prisoners of the Japanese had a 27% mortality rate. Uh, and finally, I'd like to end on biological warfare and human experimentation. That wraps up our presentation on Japanese war crimes. We hope this aids you in your studies. Thank you.